Thanks so much for having me this morning. Um, it's so, I just have to say, it's such an honor to dovetail after Kim, who has been uh, a colleague and uh, mentor of many things, including the work I'm about to present. I'm kind of going to operationalize what uh, Kim has been talking about. And how do I advance slides? Do I say ne next slide? OK, great. I do want to acknowledge that Charlotte is in the room. It was really, thank you, terrific to be able to work with her and her lab on this very exciting work. Um, one of the papers I'm going to be, one of the analyses I'm going to be talking about is just coming out. All right, so just to, I'm not going to reiterate um, Kim's eloquent description, but I think it's really important. I always think, I love the Titanic example. So much of the work that we do focuses with a spotlight on an individual. And what I've tried to do, which is sometimes really challenging in five-year funding cycles, is to turn that focus out to the environments in which people live, work, play, are abused, um, et cetera. And so really, the framework that guides this work is trying to articulate the nature of the risk environment, particularly among female sex workers. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the results of two studies, the first of which looked at the role of the police on the risk environment of street-based sex workers, a NIDA fund funded study called SAPPHIRE. I think most people know that police should have a custodial ro role in protecting everyone's health and well-being. And, you know, it's rare when you think about what you hear about in the news, the good and bad about police, usually we're talking egregious acts with young African-American men, and it very rarely is talked about women. Occasionally, um, trans women who engage in sex work have higher rates of murder than any other street-based sex work group, so that sometimes pops up, but not necessarily in the press. So even the coverage of what we considered abusive practices in the context of the illegality of sex work is gendered and sexist in nature. So when sex work is criminalized, police have a lot of discretion in what they use. And although they are meant to protect, abuses come really easily. Um, and I'm not going to show, although we have a paper coming out looking at both mundane and aggressive practices, egregious extrajudicial practices have a negative impact. So we've done interviews with police and sometimes things even moving people along, which they feel is better than arresting people for engaging in solicitation actually is harmful indirectly because women move to a space where they don't know people around them. They don't have friends there. They don't know where they can run to be safe, et cetera. And then, of course, their direct risks, and this is when you think about what the outcomes are, HIV, STIs, violence, um, also has more direct impact when police confiscate condoms. The social meaning of condoms in the criminal justice system for a number of years was evidence for sex work. So uh, the work that we did was really um, motivated and by the fact that condoms were being used as evidence. A few human rights reports came out, and that stopped in many jurisdictions. But literally, if women were carrying three condoms, they would be arrested, and prosecutors in California and New York who no longer engage in this practice would use condoms as evidence. So you can only imagine how this directly flies in the face of public health messages and STI and HIV risk for women. So the sex workers and police promoting health in risky environments, um, we like our acronyms, uh, aim to create a body of evidence. There were no studies that, A, in the US, there really are no rigorous long-term um, cohorts of female sex workers. This was the first. And if you think about the implications of that for funding, the implications of that for programs, not just research, but practice, we're kind of the only country where sex workers are fairly invisible in thinking about our national, national HIV strategy and how it's been enacted over time. Um, the HIV rates are not as high among cis-based uh, sex workers as they are among, among trans, but still, you'll see the rates that we found are relatively high. Today, I'm not going to talk about, we did a bunch of ethnography with police trying to understand the context. and. It's interesting, we did this right after Freddie Gray, so you can imagine the kinds of data we um, got from sitting with cops six to 10 hours in their cars. It was quite fascinating in Baltimore. Um, and that really provided an understanding to articulate and illuminate that context. Today, I'm going to talk about data from the cohort study of cis and trans women that we followed over a year, recruited through targeted sampling um, in 2016 and 17. 
The red circles indicate hot spots around arrest for solicitation, which in Maryland is done by a vice squad, so it's targeted by 911 calls. We also map drug arrests because uh, the Venn diagram between street-based sex work for cis women and drugs is kind of 90% overlap. Um, and we also uh, use 911 calls and a very interesting John's website that talks about where uh, women sell sex. And we felt that, that uh, it, there was like 95% overlap in all of these sources. We interviewed women 40 to 55 minutes. Um, we gave them a lot of resources, information, triggered by answers in the survey. Tailored, that was tailored to the area where they were. Um, and then we gave out lots of swag. We always brand our studies so people come back, because they're a hard group to follow in, um, reach again. Um, we also gave out Narcan. And when fentanyl test strips became decriminalized in Maryland, in part because of our work, we started giving out fentanyl test strips. I just give a plug for all of that because it's really important to give whatever we can give, particularly to these women that are really resource poor. So I'm going to quickly just give a few characteristics before I get into STI data um, of who these cis and trans women were. I bolded the differences between the two. The cis women were largely white. That was something that all the papers we've submitted, no one believes the high percentage of whites. Um, because we wanted to recruit women who had exposure to police, we recruited them from the street, not thinking about the fact because of exposure, disproportionate exposure and harassment, a lot of African American women didn't sell sex on the street anymore. So uh, we, we missed that a bit, although we have a study now where we have higher, a higher percentage of African American women. Trans women were largely African American. On the face of it, the trans women, except for unemployment, they were a lot more stable, less drugs, higher rates of completing high school, less hunger, um, less likely to be homeless, but much higher rates of HIV because of the people with whom they were having sex with and a lot of constrained opportunities by the fact of being a black trans woman in Baltimore City. And just to say, they were mostly recruited in one area where it's a well-known stroll for trans sex workers. Um, high rates of client violence, high rates of um, interpersonal violence, lots of drug trauma with experiences of overdose among the cis, and high rates of drug use. So just to look at the baseline STIs and HIV, I'm going to focus now on the cis cohort because they were it was a larger cohort. Um, you can see the HIV rate was 5%. The current study we have of 380 women, it's actually 70%. And incredibly high rates. This was These were baseline rates of STIs. And a lot of women actually didn't know. Less than 10% of all women who were tested positive knew that they had STIs. Um, this uh, de depicts, I added brackets to show the percentage and the percentages of people who reported, self-reported, that they were treated. We worked with the health department. A lot of studies in Baltimore, you can only imagine, there are lots of people for the health department to contact um, who have STI. So we actually functioned as DIS, um, and we had someone on our staff who worked at the health department as well to follow up and let people know for mandatory reportable diseases that they were um, infected. Trick, something that we always find is high. It obviously doesn't have the same sequelas. Um, gonorrhea and chlamydia is just always off the charts. In this population, it was 65% in a sample of exotic dancers that we studied. So STIs are something the burden is really high. I have to say the health department, um, and you know, God bless the Baltimore Health Department with whom I've worked for 15 years, um, someone who didn't know our work actually told her boss, like, all these people are finding out from this place called Sapphire, like, what's going on that they're, that somebody named, something named Sapphire is giving them, there are all these rates of high STIs that we haven't treated before, as opposed to thank you, we should work together. Wow, you're finding people that aren't in our system, which was the case. Um, that wasn't all the way up to leadership, but it was amazing to us that there were people out in the field who had no idea uh, how, that they weren't reaching this population. And you know, sadly, a study was reaching this population. So they now are working with a mobile van at night when we're doing outreach for an intervention I'm about to tell you about. But it's so important for studies and for health departments to work together. 
and that's not a slam on the Baltimore City Health Department who has lots to do, but uh, this is a forgotten population. No one is doing work really with street-based sex workers in Baltimore City, although they have incredibly high rates of vulnerability in STIs. And this is just to show that over time, the incidence was really high. This is a Kaplan-Meier curve that models the probability of uh, being infected over time as measured in days, and it was just incredibly high rates of incident STIs. We, as I showed in the beginning, we interviewed women every three months um, with a possibility of five interviews in one year. Um, to look at the predictors of incident chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trick, you can see that there's some similarities and some differences. Um, chlamydia makes sense, recent initiation into sex work, as well as TRIC. Um, forced to have sex by clients, three times odds of um, having an incident, gonorrhea. And we don't really understand the nature of this, but drugs and alcohol intoxication were somehow protective uh, for gonorrhea. And then trichomoniasis, um, having a female sexual partner, which makes sense, um, and biologically, because that's uh, the STI that can, be, that can be passed that way. And then having health care was actually protective for trichomoniasis. So um, we also, and we are working on this analysis right now, because the parent study was looking at the role of police, we were interested in the concept of police as clients. That would be clients that pay, clients that don't pay, but it's we asked women if you had police that were clients. We separately asked if they were coerced by police, so we can't say that the clients that they reported were coerced. That was something, sadly, after 20 years of doing surveys, you still find things you should have asked differently, but so it is. So uh, I'm just going to show you an STI's factor into this, um, looking at people that did and did not have um, clients. So 8%, uh, sorry, that's not true. 30% of the population reported having police as clients, and you can see there are no significant differences. Again, this is cis. There are no significant differences in terms of um, the sociodemographics. Women that reported police as clients were more likely to have more frequent daily heroin use in the past 12 months, and also daily sex work. So they were likely more engaged. They were more exposed to cops by being on the street more because the drug market and the sex market is really inextricably tied among this population. In terms of, I'm going to skip to the punchline, looking at correlates of police and clients over time, we could not, when we did this with partial data, when we did this with the whole sample, having a posi positive chlamydia or gonorrhea concurrent with reporting that police was a client was um, to confer to two and a half times odd of having um, a police's client being diagnosed with chlamydia or gonorrhea, diagnosed by us. Um, I also mentioned we measured women's exposure in scales to just basic Police practices like asking for an ID, doing a, uh, doing a warrant check. So that was not significantly, we called them patrol practices, but egregious practices, which were verbal sexual harassment, being physically hit, sexual extortion, verbal abuse, all in one scale. That also was significantly associated with police as clients. This is not to say that having sex with a police person, a uh, policeman, was the reason that you, that's where you caught chlamydia and gonorrhea, but obviously it confers this notion of the risk environment, what it is to be vulnerable in this case, and probably lots of other aspects in these women's lives, even among this at-risk population. So switching to our next JUUL study, Emerald, which evaluates an intervention, what do you do when you have all of these data? We're working with a sex worker activist group who hopefully advocates um, will do an intervention with the police. As Kim said, it's really hard to um, change structures immediately, and although you don't want to just focus on women with they, it's their responsibility, we actually developed an intervention for a drop-in center based on the needs that women have looking at what resources they've used in the past six months. So this is from the next study that evaluates a community level drop-in center and outreach targeting sex workers. And you can see that HIV and STIs are services that women seek, whether it was testing and treatment in that question. We asked them what their, what their greatest health concerns were and what services they had used. 
Um, a third of the women had not used any service, and lots of their health care is provided by the emergency room, even with high rates of insurance. Habit dies hard. People go to the emergency room with lots of things. Okay, so to, in the last minute and 43 seconds that I have, just to talk about the intervention that we have that target women. This is also a NIDA funded study, which is meant to exactly what Kim said, bolster a sense of, first a sense of community period, a sense of cohesion among women, but we target street-based sex workers. Um, we have these services as of November 6th, we will have been open two years. Um, we leveraged a lot of our relationships with various organizations. The health department provides HIV, STI testing and treatment, reproductive health services. We have a collaborating organization that um, we induct and maintain women with a very low threshold buprenorphine um, and hopefully are starting that two days a week. We have two legal partners. We just started syringe services programs, which became legal a few years ago outside of the Baltimore City Health Department. We have a psychiatrist starting. You can see those services down to a place for women to eat, get clothes, rest, sleep. Hunger is so prevalent among this population and actually significantly associated with um, HIV. People come in hungry, so a lot of our services developed around the needs of the population that we see in the center and also that they presented, uh, that they reported in the broader community evaluation. And just to say over time, we've had a lot more visits. We have about 85 women a week. Um, a lot of women come that have been kicked out from other services because they're loud, they smell, they're not on their medication, et cetera. And although this isn't directly addressing issues of, you know, violence against pol uh, the police egregious behaviors, it's meant to bolster a sense of community and also um, help women engage providing services to kind of bring stability under their feet. So these are the conclusions that you can read. I am at time and thank you. Thank you very much.